Hello legends, we're back on for a quick little YouTube episode. If you struggle with hamstring cramping at the end of cross country races, then this video will help you. I quite often get DM'd by people asking me how they can overcome it. When I ask them what are they actually doing in the training at the moment for the hamstrings, very commonly they will say, I'm doing kettlebell swings. So if you're doing a lot of kettlebell swings and you're still getting hamstring cramps, at the end of a cross country race, potentially the kettlebell swings might not be doing what you think they're doing. Here's a couple of things that I see most people get, I don't wanna say wrong, but go a little bit uh, off track with their kettlebell swings. One is using a weight that's basically a glorified paperweight. Two would be they break more at the knees than the hips. So it looks like this, it's more of a squat. So when we break more at the knees, we lose tension in the hamstrings, so it just doesn't even become a hamstring exercise then. And three, would be doing it with about as much intent as someone trying to rock a baby to sleep in a pram. So, if we wanna condition our hamstrings better for what we face on the dirt bike, one, we need to load them, so we need time under tension. Two, need our hip hinge mechanics to be solid, to be dialed. Most people aren't, most people can't hinge at the hips. That's why they default to bending at the knees when they perform a swing. And three, we need to expose them to both power and time under tension. So high velocity contractions, which basically is what a kettlebell swing is. It is a power movement. So it should be performed with a high level in, of intent and like trying to, we're trying to put that kettlebell through the roof using our posterior chain. So what it actually looks like with a little bit of decent weight is a proper hinge. At the bottom of the movement, it's a vertical shin. The hips are back, tension's in the hamstring, and then we're exploding up using the posterior chain to project the kettlebell up, not lift the kettlebell with our arms. The, Movement is all coming from the posterior chain. So to get that dialed, again, we need to have solid hip hinge mechanics. So I actually place a kettlebell swing a fair way down the line in the hip hinge continuum. I very rarely give it to clients now anyway because I'll, I'll walk you through the other, the way we manage the posterior chain training. However, it's certainly not the first exercise I'm gonna give someone because as I touched on, most people struggle with a quality hip hinge. So first things first, we wanna develop a quality hip hinge. So I use a variety of exercises to teach my clients that, to teach them how to hinge at the hips really well, how to manage our center of mass, stack the rib cage in a hinge pattern. We wanna be able to develop that slowly. And what I mean by that is slowing the movement down so we can feel the muscles that we're trying to load, which is the hamstrings and the glutes for the most part in a hinge pattern. So the best way to do that is slowing the movement down with tempo, bringing some load in over time. Once we got to a point that we can perform that with a little bit of load slowly, then potentially we could progress to something that's a lot faster, like a kettlebell swing. That being said, I very rarely program them for my clients, as I mentioned. The power side for the posterior chain, we come at that more from a plyometric uh, standpoint. So I would argue that something like a broad jump, particularly like a continuous broad jump, would be a much higher velocity contraction and a much faster contraction for the hamstrings and the posterior chain than a kettlebell swing will ever be. So we kind of come at that power side uh, with the plyometrics. So we include lots of broad jump variations where it's about maximal output. So I'm trying to jump from this side of the room to that side of the room. So it's a fast contraction and it's a high force contraction. So then the, I guess the time under tension side, so something like a kettlebell swing or a broad jump or a plyometric, it's very fast. So it's not a lot of time under, although the movement is fast, there's a high velocity there, there's not a lot of time under tension for the hamstrings. So if you think about when we're riding our dirt bike, there is a lot of fast movement. So we definitely need to be powerful in the posterior chain. However, there is also a lot of isometric 
uh, movements and more time under tension, potentially when we're standing in that attack position for a longer period of time down a straight that might not be that rough. So for that more, I guess, conditioning that time under tension um, component for the hamstrings and the posterior chain, a much better option in my book is the king, the king of the movements, my old mate, the RDL. <laughs> so everyone knows I love RDLs. And this is just another reason why they're so good is because we can manipulate the time under tension. So this is my body weight, 80 kilos, fairly respectable, modest target for you guys to work up to with your RDLs that I personally see with the results in my clients once they get to this level and a little bit above, they can tolerate a lot of, uh, the, the capacity to tolerate loads on the dirt bike is all positive. The feedback is very positive from my clients when they can reach these targets and beyond. So the beauty of the RDL is there's two ways I can progress this exercise. These are fairly light for me. I can add more weight to this exercise to make it harder or more intense, I can also slow this movement down. So I can increase the time under tension by slowing the tempo of the exercise down. So I could put more weight on the bar to make this more intense. I could slow this down. I could take one, two, three, four, five, six, three, two, one. So three full seconds pause at the bottom locking it out. We can do that for reps. So six seconds down, three seconds at the bottom, second or two on the way up. It's almost 10 seconds of time under tension for one rep. So it's kind of two ends of the spectrum, right? We definitely want to expose the hamstrings to that velocity. Not saying a kettlebell swing is a bad exercise for that. I just like to uh, come at that power side from the plyometrics. Again, the beauty of the plyometrics is it's, it's measurable too. We can measure how far can we jump. So that's something we can track as we get stronger, as we get more powerful, we can measure how much further can we jump. Apart from just adding more weight to a kettlebell swing and, and looking at it visually with your eye, it's, there's not as much that we can measure with a kettlebell swing in comparison to something like plyometrics. So that's how we come at it is we, we tick that velocity box with our plyometrics and then we tick the time under tension box with the RDL variations. Then of course we also incorporate like a ton of inner range hamstring work where we're like working on that hamstring actually bending the knee in at knee flexion. So that's a big component of what we do and I do believe that that plays a big role in conditioning the hamstrings uh, for that sort of longer duration when we're getting these long races that are very demanding on the hamstring. So hopefully there's some value in there for you, whether you are a kettlebell swinger or whether you're looking for other ways to mix it up. Hopefully you got something out of that video and we'll see you in the next episode.